The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Father, we just thank you for this word that you've given forth this morning, that we're going to be trained and equipped and more totally uh, prepared for the days ahead, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's message is the seven keys, seven keys to the cultivating the ear of a mystic. I want to explain that word mystic because it's been hijacked from the Christian church. That used to be a very good word. Mystic was a person who had deep spiritual experience with Jesus, all right? And later they made that word apply to everything that comes down the pike. But a mystic in, in the context of a believer is to draw so close to him that you have that intimate, acquainted with him and that your reality comes out of a relationship, not out of just head knowledge. And so that's what we want to pray. And I want to use seven, uh, really seven keys that over a period of time, uh, God trained me uh, in the school of prayer. And uh, I'm going to cover, uh, just to make it kind of an outline, uh, over the years, he trained me using a, a one particular chapter out of the scriptures, Isaiah chapter 50. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, Isaiah chapter 50. And during that season, uh, early in my Christian walk, that God had already given me a, 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 a primary scripture that was going to be my determined purpose. And as a matter of fact, the Amplified Bible says it that way. Ephesians 3.10 starts out with my determined purpose in the Amplified Translation. For my determined purpose is that I might know him that I might become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his personhood. Read Philippians 3.10 in the Amplified sometime, but there was the, it was what I call the railroad track scripture, and you have some of those, probably are written in your Bible somewhere in the cover, certain key. I found that when a believer has particular scriptures that are significant to them, that God uses that as kind of a signpost and kind of a guardrail, if you would, for you. He knows you inside out and backwards. So when you have key scriptures, it's not just something that he thought he would just drop in there for no purpose at all. He knows your tendencies to stray. And if so, he will give you a primary uh, handful of scriptures that basically become like a guardrail. So uh, look at your Bibles if you have something significant written in the front of them and see how you're doing. Uh, Use those as kind of like, am I off track? Am I off the the beaten path, so to speak? Or am I on the highway to holiness and the plans and purposes of God? Well, God said that I might know him was the primary purpose. The second thing that he wanted me was that he wanted to cultivate within me a steadfast devotion to that purpose. So it's one thing to know what your purpose is. The second requirement was a steadfast devotion to purpose. And when I look at this portion of scripture, that's to me basically what it said uh, in its entirety. Isaiah 50 verses 4 through 7. This was the portion of scripture that I was trained with in what I call the school of the spirit and the school of prayer. He basically said, the Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I would know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my hear to hear as the learned or the, as a disciple. For the Lord God has opened my ear. <clears throat> I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord will help me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, 
And it's basically saying, I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. Uh, I put up with whatever the world could throw at me. And nevertheless, I have set my face like flint. It was basically that he was saying is that step one is that you pursue me with all your heart, regardless of what, what, brings, uh, what happens in your life. The second thing is remain steadfast in your devotion to this purpose, that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with him. Well, uh, <clears throat> everybody knows that the foundation of our Christian life is the Word of God. But, you know, I saw so much uh, in the years growing in the Lord of how many people knew the Word, but it was pretty much memorized or in their head. Their experience was far below their knowledge of the Word. And what God basically was saying, to cultivate the ear of a mystic, the one who knows him intimately and draws close to him, that this deep spiritual experience with God has to be a real experience. Just like it says to the mature church in Ephesians, it says that you would know the love of God. And the Amplified says that you would actually experience it, not just know about it, but experience it. <clears throat> so I broke it down uh, when, when God was revealing this portion of scripture to me over a period of time, I broke it down into what does the word say, how do you do it, when do you do it, who do you do it to, why do you do it, where is it, and what is the way that it actually operates. And so that's basically what I'm going to cover, those seven W's of cultivating. <clears throat> Thank you, sweetheart. <clears throat> That's my angel. She wasn't going to let me choke up here or have it dry. She takes care of me. Okay? So, let's start again. Definition of a mystic is a Christian pursuing deep spiritual experience with God. Would that apply to you? Could you own that expression? Hmm? So then you're all going to become even more mystical, all right, in your intimacy in your pursuit with God. The first thing that, that, that God said is, is we're starting with the what of the word, the substance of the word. What is it? Well, Matthew 4.4 4 is a common verse of scripture that everybody can quote it, but it says, he answered them and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. There's a proceeding word. There's a word that comes directly from the heart of God. There's a rhema word. There's a now word that comes from the heart of God. And knowing what that is has to have the ear to hear what the Spirit's saying. Because there's a lot of words. You can read your Bible all day long and not know the difference between reading your Bible for total concept and having a word that is a now word that God is speaking out of the context of the whole. He's speaking a specific word at a specific time to you as a specific person. It's important to cultivate that. If you're ever going to really uh, deepen that intimate relationship with God, you need to know what word he's speaking out of the whole context of the word. So to speak a word as a disciple, I must hear as a disciple. For him to speak a word, if I'm going to be the disciple, he's going to be the master, then I need to know that my sustenance or my primary purpose in knowing him is that I can't live by bread alone, that I must live by the, by the proceeding word that comes from the mouth of God for me, not for someone else, but for me, that it's I must eat, I must feed and it's interesting that I believe even to the overcomers in the book of Revelations, all of it's pertaining to dining. It's pertaining to not just uh, fellowshipping. It's not talking about uh, spaghetti dinners. It's talking about basically feeding upon him. He that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. The what of the word and why it's so important is I believe people can know the word inside out and backwards, but not see a lot of success in their individual Christian life. It's almost like what God is speaking. It's time to awake out of that slumber, that believe it or not, you're sleeping unless you can hear an awakened word, a word that's been incited to action, a word that's been quickened, that you can hear what the Spirit's saying. The word in Isaiah 55, 
verses 10 and 11 says, just as the rain comes down and the snows from heaven, and it does not return there, but waters the earth, it, makes, it brings forth things bud, they grow, it gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it will accomplish what I please and it will prosper in the thing that I sent for. If you just look at that and you said, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, the very substance before you start eating the whole concept of God, and which is a good thing to study. You should be studying your word from beginning to end. You should know the total concept. Nevertheless, in your relationship with Jesus, the living word, you should know when is he speaking a word to me specifically. And then know this, that to the degree that you feast upon it, honor it, cherish it, absorb it, allow it to change your life and impact your life according to what is said, it says that part is guaranteed to prosper and accomplish the thing for which it was sent. So think about it. How many times have you got nice words and then kind of dismissed it? When in reality, if God gave you a nice word, and he does give nice words, when he gives you a nice word, that means this is guaranteed. This will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. The problem will be on your end as to whether or not you're going to assimilate it and act on it and allow it to have rule in your life. But if you do let it have rule in your life, it will accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Which means you will bring pleasure to the heart of God, and you will prosper. It's all a question of whether or not you can hear and have ears to hear what he's saying. And when you hear what he's saying, you also embrace it, assimilate it, feed we often said that over and over again, uh, to feed as opposed to just read and to drink as opposed to think. Because he says, he says, his blood was drink indeed and his flesh was food indeed. We have to understand that that was not some kind of bizarre cannibalism, but in reality what he was saying is, is I am the word made flesh and that I am living and active and powerful sharper than a two-edged sword. I can divide within your heart this which is good and this which is evil and then put you back together again to where you prosper in the thing for which I sent it. You know, quite frankly, each and every one of us, because God spoke us into existence, into our mother's womb, all of us were a word or a seed that was spoken, placed in our mother's womb with all of the potential to be totally pleasing to God and everything in us to be the fully developed uh, individual, unique, one of a kind, never was another you, never will be another you person on the face of the earth. Just think, if we're not prospering in the things of life in, in the kingdom, it's because we have not taken to heart what he said to us or we've been sleeping, so to speak, and have not awakened that ear to hear properly. But he is speaking a word to us all the time. I said the number one mistake, I believe, in cultivating an ear to hear, the number one mistake is basically that when God speaks, he speaks so quietly and subtly in the still small voice that most of the time your likes and dislikes can be so noisy and loud that you don't hear clearly. The carnal mind can make a lot of noise. It can go on and on and on. And if there is a, a word that God is speaking to us probably for the next few weeks uh, over and over again that I'm seeing people sabotage with much thinking, when in reality they'd be better off soaking and eating and feasting upon the things that they did know and let God elaborate on it rather than go to your head and you elaborate on it. You'll come up with all kinds of conclusions and some of it's silly, all right? But if you let God take the word that God gives and let him amplify it, you're going to come with greater substance. You're going to come with true food. Too much thinking in the body of Christ. Too much exalting the mind of reason. And the mind of reason is at enmity with God. So at what point do you want to quit unnecessary warfare and find out what God is saying to you and embrace it, cherish it, love it, and let it grow and develop? So I must hear as a disciple. 
the promise of the, of the word is that I can't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And secondly, that every word that comes out of the mouth of God will prosper in the thing for which it was sent. So why would I want to get sidetracked? Why would I want to get into my reasoning mind and think that I've got a better idea? All right. So uh, often saw that in the Lord's Prayer was one of the first things that I noticed and I can't remember if I heard it preached or if I read it or, or what, but that in both accounts of the Lord's Prayer, which were uh, two years apart, neither one implies that you tell him your situation. How many people, when they pray, they're busy telling God all about everything that God already knows about? All right. Did you see that my car broke down on, on Route 77? Did you, well, God, did you, you know? And it's like, why are you telling him this? Like, he doesn't know this? In neither account, when the, when the Lord was going to give, this is how you should pray, does it say, tell him everything because he's unaware of everything. He's like this absent-minded professor who's busy uh, taking care of other people's issues. And, and uh, he, he said, what, what, who, who, who are you? Where, what's your name? All right. He's not having a senior moment. He's omniscient. Okay. But neither of them implies that you tell him your situation. In both accounts, they were two years apart in the Gospels, uh, one in Matthew and one in Luke, uh, when they said, uh, but he said, the Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask him. And what was funny is, as a young Christian, God wouldn't let me even study a lot of books on prayer that I wanted to until later. First, he said, I'm going to take you to the school. And I, I really appreciate it now. When I look back on it, thank God I didn't go to the books first because I would have made a system out of prayer. I would have just taken it and instead of it being a relationship, I would have applied all kinds of prayer and done them all to make sure I covered all my bases. That's just the way I think. But what he did was basically said, you know what? You don't have anything to pray or say until you've heard something. Until you've heard something, you don't really have anything to say. Aren't we supposed to pray the word? But if you haven't really heard the word, are you picking and choosing the word and you just pray whatever word you want to? You don't even need a relationship with Jesus for that. You could just do that strictly from the intellect. But God's saying these two uh, accounts of prayer shows that God is giving you his undivided attention and when he gives you a specific word he knows exactly everything about you even the things you don't know about yourself of course the things you don't know about yourself so uh, the what of the word then translated into how okay so the second part in the school of cultivating the ear of the mystic is the how-tos, much of which is our entire ministry. We are told that, uh, that we don't just operate out of strategy, we actually operate out of tactics. I like that. That's a new one for me. I always saw David and the way he would relate to God. He would get a word, he would get a strategy, and it wasn't the same old technique over and over again. He had to hear specifically what God was saying in a specific situation that applied for him. And the tactics often were different. The strategy is to overcome the enemy. That's general. But the tactics changed with application. And God says, it's like this with your life too. So the how of the word is, is basically that God would give me the tongue of a disciple that I would know how to speak a word. And how to speak that word was something that basically... God showed me again and again, there was times that I would speak everything that God gave me, and then I found out that wasn't right. You know, wisdom dictates that you don't always have to say everything you know. Have you ever, <laughs> has you ever, got, have you ever shot yourself in the foot relationally by saying everything you know? I can remember the first time God was teaching me this. I had a, um, uh, I was 29 years old, and I had a Sunday school teacher telling me, insisting that I do something. And I felt like she was talking to me like I was a little boy, and I didn't care for that. So I just said, uh, no, no, thank you. I'm going to go over here because my friend is the guest speaker. And she goes, no, you have to do that, Dennis. And I said, we well, don't have to be angry. I knew by my spirit that she was mad even though she was smiling. Have you ever been around someone who's smiling but they're angry at the same time? 
And I went by my discernment, and one of the first things the Lord taught me was, you might be right, Dennis, but you don't have to say everything you know. Wisdom <laughs> knows when to speak, and wisdom knows when not to speak. So I found out that even if I was right, you can be so right you're wrong. That the how of the word and cultivating that ear was to know how to speak a word, just like the scripture says, in season. Well, that wasn't the season for me to tell everything I knew. Isn't that amazing? I just thought you just, if God gives it to you, you blurt it out, all right? But uh, this doesn't work favorably relationally, does it? And so sometimes God says, know how to speak a word in season, and I'm going to have to teach Dennis what, uh, what, which season he speaks and which season he doesn't. And if you paid attention, you could find out that if I was truly functioning out of that word, that when she was telling me with a smile and angry if I would have really known how to apply the word, I would have allowed a soft answer to perhaps turn away her wrath. Wouldn't that be a better application than being right? Huh? So the how of the word is a navigating relationally in life in a way that would bring pleasure to the heart of God. It would have been better not to be right. Because some people just love that. I'm just speaking the truth. Okay, but where's the love? Where's the redemption? The next time you just speak the truth to somebody, say, where's the redemptive purpose in what you said? Because don't tell me it's just because it was right. Because you can be so right you're wrong. You can be right in content and wrong in relationship. So, do you think the how of the word was important for Dennis to learn? I think so, because I had plenty of word. I, was, I had never had a problem hearing from God. Maybe, maybe obeying God <laughs> might have been a problem every now and then, but hearing was never a problem. But how to speak a word in season, that, that was necessary. I had to learn how to shut up in a group setting. Did you know that? That you can have a lot to say, but not necessarily does God want you to talk? Hmm? Is that possible? I used to sit in Bible studies as a young Christian. I was so on fire for God that everything the preacher brought up, I had a comment on it. And so it started to look like it was my Bible study, not the preacher's Bible study, because Dennis had a comment for everything they said. All of that talking is actually coming out of insecurity and a need to be seen and heard. And you can justify it by saying, I'm right. My dad was kind of like that, and my mom had an answer for him. The entire, all the years they were married, she would say, Lloyd, if you would just listen, you might learn something. <laughs> over and over again, because my dad was a talker, but being a talker doesn't mean you're a good listener, does it? So the how of the word would be, God, teach me to not just know how to speak a word in season, but, you know, uh, the teach me to track how many are familiar with that word, track? Teach me to track where that so-called audience or relationship is at a given point in time. If a person's got a heavy heart, I don't know, telling them a bunch of happy thoughts, they might just feel like you're not even there. You're not even aware of where I'm at. You don't know how to listen. You only know how to talk. And what was that one statement our friend told us about the the Harvard graduate who had a, some kind of a commencement service or something. It was, all he did was, um, enough about me. What do you think about me? Huh? How's that for a self-centered statement? Enough about me, but what do you think about me? All right. So can you do that in a conversation? Does that necessarily build relationship? No. So... The how of the word, the first thing he taught me, and I used words that were subjective. And, and when I discipled Jennifer in the way I pray, I used the words that I used at that time. There's probably better words. But the first thing that I learned was that in my relationship with him, any word that he spoke, I cherished it. Now, cherish can sound like a mental thing. But in reality, it was no, no, I have something that has life on it. And it's on the inside, and it's more in my heart 
than in my head. And to cherish it, I'm going to honor it. To cherish a word that God's speaking or to respect the author of that word, you cherish the word. You don't treat it lightly. I believe right now we're in a time and a season where God is saying to the church at large, and you can take this prophetically because I know that this is timely. He's saying, awake, awake out of your slumber because you're sleeping. I know you're a believer. I know you're a Christian. I know you know the word, but awake, awake because you're still slumbering. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory it means come out of the death. Sleep oftentimes means death. That your flesh is ruling and you're numb and you need to arise out of that. Awake, awake. You who sleep in slumber, know the time is, is, is right. But this, uh, this cherish was something that I did and then in cherishing it I found out that it wasn't memorization but when I cherish that word take any word that God's speaking to you or has spoken to you or you've written down in your journal you wrote it uh, something you heard in a song and it just doesn't leave that word if you would cherish it absorb it and say I want to be a partaker of the divine nature feeding and drinking on God is not knowing it in your head but feeding upon it until it leaves a residue of his nature to where it's written on the tablet of your heart didn't you ever wonder about that expression written on the tablet of your heart didn't you ever wonder when the, when the epistles talk about you being a living epistle which means you're not just somebody who's saying the same things that I'm saying. A living epistle means it's been written on the tablet of your heart and you are declaring it by your life. Your life is declaring it even when you're not saying it. That's the difference between cherishing, absorbing, and then communicating it out of the abundance of the heart. So that's the, the how uh, the, of that word that was developed. The when of that word. Basically, a word in season. Isaiah 50, verse 4, says that Lord God has given me the tongue of a disciple that I would know how to speak a word in season or the when. When, in season. And I think we touched on this already a little bit, but in relationship with God, there's a when, and in relationship with other people, there's a when. There's a time to not sing songs to a heavy heart. There's a when for the word. There's a lot of times we've prayed with people where God gave me a word of knowledge and I sat on it until that person was at a particular place to where it would do them some good. Sometimes it doesn't do them any good. Sometimes you're premature and you abort. And the lesson that God gave me was when I was a young Christian, I was in a, a Pentecostal type church and uh, they would be telling stories of the old times, the way it used to be done. And the, it, the way it used to be done is they got so religious into their system that they were anti-jewelry, anti-makeup on the ladies, the whole thing. And in that process, if someone got baptized in the, in the spirit and began to speak in other tongues, they would actually put their hand over their mouth because you're not ready yet. We didn't get all your lipstick off and all your makeup off. And that was a teaching to me to say, gee, didn't they do that with Jesus? Didn't they try to put him in there like a round peg in a square hole? They were upset that his disciples were not fasting his disciples were not doing this. They were working on the Sabbath. They were actually healing people on the Sabbath. It's, it's, it's almost like that the, the when of the word needs to be God's priority, not your priority. I think the when of the word, you give the word, a lot of times you give somebody that's irritating you a word simply because it's more appealing to your present condition to straighten them out. God's when was timed a lot different. His priorities were in order. He, he might have thought instead of worrying about that person quitting smoking cigarettes, maybe, maybe, maybe he ought to stop beating his wife first. <laughs> Can you imagine that? In other words, we don't always know the priorities, but tracking 
in your heart, God will give you the promptings of when to speak and when not to speak. And you can know how to speak. You need to know when someone is ripe, when they're open. Very often, in, uh, if you go to a restaurant or something, I can tell pretty much how open uh, a, a waitress is, saved or unsaved, to once you start talking. You can tell when the wall goes up or when they're wide open and listening. You can do this with clerks. Tracking is important because it teaches you to navigate in an environment relationally. And what good is that word if you're just gonna beat people over the head with it? There are more preacher's kids that are no longer serving God because they didn't like the religion that they were raised under. Many times because it was forced on them legalistically. There is a when. There is a word and there is a season. And that season is the when of the word and you need to learn to track. You also need to learn to speak from the place of peace. If there's a push in you and you speak the word to somebody, that's not the prompting of the Holy Spirit. That's your willpower. Trying to get something across. Trying to make something happen. That's the when. Are you ready for the the who. This is the fourth element. The who of the word. Well, Isaiah 50 verses 4 and 5 says, The Lord has given me the tongue of a learned disciple. He's going to teach me how to speak. He's going to teach me when to speak. And to him who is weary. In other words, the word spoken should be a word that can be to heal, encourage, comfort, admonish, but it's going to deal with the person in need. And you could say, well, everybody's in need. Yes, but not everybody is in need of that exact word. They have an exact word. And what I saw with the who was how uniquely Jesus ministered to individuals without giving them all a canned answer. And my favorite illustration has always been the one disciple says, I, Jesus, will follow you wherever you go. And he tells him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, son of man has nowhere to lay his head. All right? Specifically to that person, he had a word. But it was different than the other one who came running up and said, I too will follow you wherever you go, but let me first go bury my father. And he says, no, you come now. No, wait a minute. This one, he says, you need to think about it. And this one, he says, you come now. He knew individually where a, a person was, could track with them so that he knew the right word to speak in the right time and the right season. We need to get so aware of people by the Spirit, not according to the flesh, but by the Spirit, that God will prompt us to speak that word. If you make yourself available, he'll show you who's ripe, and he'll show you what word needs to be spoken to him. You don't give the same answer the same way. As a matter of fact, I think it would benefit the whole church if we even just studied the temperaments. You know what I mean by the temperaments? The cleric, the sanguine, the D, the I, the S, the C, those that were trained by that because you approach different people differently. You don't approach them the way you would want to be approached. That's self-centered. No, you approach them in a way that would be conducive to their good, their redemptive purpose. Some people, you give it to them right between the eyes. Other people, you do that and you, and you just devastated them and you did damage. Why can't we learn the difference? We can. We have to love our differences though or we won't minister effectively to the who. So, whosoever, that means the whole world, but at the same time, you can learn to track and minister a word in season to them that are weary. And quite frankly, there are some people that if you don't give it to them between the eyes, they think you're weak. There's other people, if you give it to them between their eyes, they think you have just judged them and hate them and dislike them. So perception is a lot. If you're really going to love people, you're going to love the differences and you're going to move based on their perception, based on where they're at, spirit to spirit, not just what's convenient for you. So the, the who of the word requires cultivation. It, it requires identifying the people that God has placed in your life and what? Knowing them by the spirit. I used to be able to tell people that knew my heart 
better than they knew my personality. Um, whenever you say something wrong or you mess up and they say, I know what he meant, what he meant was. If someone can legitimately know what you really meant, they probably know you by the heart more than they know you by what you said specifically. I also know people that they hang on every word you say and God forbid you just don't say it exactly right and, and they're going to call you on the carpet and they're going to be devastated. People that hang on to words like that are insecure and they need developed themselves relationally because they're taking things in concrete terms rather than knowing somebody by the spirit not according to the flesh. If you're one of those people that can remember words that people spoke that were wrong years ago, you need to start repenting and get your heart cleansed because that is a bad, bad, bad habit. Well, I remember they said some of the most difficult people, some of the people that have the greatest fear of intimacy in real, honest-to-goodness relationships have a mind like an elephant. They can remember every little detail, which also means they have an unforgiving heart and that they're forming, they're forming opinions based on words, not by the person themselves. The who of the word is when you basically know where they're coming from and what do they mean. I used to have a, a person in, in, in my life years, years ago that you could not joke with them, ever, ever. I found out later that they probably needed healing because they used to get teased even when they were in high school and college. They'd be teased mercilessly by other people for being kind of a nerd or whatever. And, um, but from that time on, you can't joke. And it was almost like after a while, you just learn, you know what, let it go. Because until they develop a sense of humor, don't go there, all right? because they're gonna take it word for word and they're gonna make it concrete and they're not gonna navigate around it, so don't joke, all right? That's the, the who of the word. To whom are you speaking? Because God, you need to identify the people that God's placing in your life because he's placing all kinds of people in your life, in your sphere of influence, and you need to adjust in love. Say that with me. I need to adjust in love because they're all different kinds of people. So the adjustment is not on God's part. The adjustment is on our part that we would know who God has placed in our life. Because ultimately, I believe there's going to be times of great awakening. But just think, the fields are white for the harvest already. But if you have all those opinions and blockages and you don't know by the spirit, you only know by body language and by observation, you're not going to know who's white for the harvest. There's probably divine appointments that God's placed in your life that you never developed because you already had an opinion. If you have an opinion, those mental opinions can stand in the way of ever knowing somebody by the spirit. But the heart of Jesus wants to give you the eyes of Jesus so that you can see who's ripe for the harvest. Who do you speak to and who do you don't? Jennifer and I, we used to go through the mall and just try to, just uh, it was kind of a training to see what was in somebody's heart. And I can remember uh, uh, the people in the kiosk that want to put cream on her hands and stuff. And sometimes you'd say no and sometimes uh, no big deal. That was their job and they knew they expected a lot of no's, and uh, I don't know what percentage they made based on sales, but in sales, you better get used to people saying no. Then there was people that said no that felt like they got angry. Then there was people that said no that when you said no, it felt like you kicked them in the gut. And my first thought was probably shouldn't be in sales if you're going to take every no that personal. But you know, you can know that by the Spirit. As a matter of fact, I walked up to one young, one young lady and I asked her because she was so devastated when we said no that I was thinking, oh my goodness, that shouldn't hurt that bad. What are you interested in? Are you going to school? Uh, actually, I was doing... <laughs> uh, academic counseling, <laughs> trying to teach her where, maybe you should look for a different line of work because this may be necessary for a season, but this is probably not what you're cut out to do. All right. Other people, it's like, 
hey, a couple more no's and I'm bound to make a sale. You know, there's a whole different attitude for different types of personalities. But the who of the word is God wants your love to abound more and more in all real knowledge. By the way, this is Philippians 1.9, and this was a training verse for me. That your love would abound, the love abounding, overflowing, means all kinds of people, knowing them by the Spirit, not according to the flesh. And then it said in real knowledge, real knowledge means revelation knowledge or Jesus knowledge, in real knowledge and all discernment. And that leads you to another scripture that says, the spiritual man discerns all things. So I think that's kind of a nice high standard that we should all have. The high standard is we should know other people by the Spirit. The spiritual man discerns how many things? All things. All right? So then that means we're going to learn to love our differences, but we're also going to learn how to navigate in real Jesus knowledge and all discernment. That's the who of the word. The next one, the why of the word. A word in season to him who is weary. God has given me the tongue of the learned that I would speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear. The Lord has opened my ear and I was not rebellious nor did I turn away. What God is basically saying is the why of the word or the purpose or the, what, what's the end of the charge of that word going forth. Besides the fact that it accomplishes what it went for, the, <clears throat> the why of the word is, believe it or not, a word in season is like apples of gold and frames of silver. But a word in season actually takes that person and breaks a yoke of fleshly or worldly control. When a word penetrates an individual, when a now word penetrates, it can, it can actually incite to action dormant giftings. It can remove barriers in their life. It can comfort them. It can encourage. It can edify, just like a prophetic word. Comfort, edify, encourage, can admonish as well. But it can break yokes. And so just think, if we would take words to heart that God was speaking, even through other people. You know, one of the weaknesses in criticism is that we have a tendency to get defensive when we're criticized, but there might be a nugget of truth that you could take to the Lord and say, what? What is there? Because don't forget, every one of us, say this with me, I have a blind spot. I have a blind spot that everybody else sees, that everybody else sees, but I don't. That, ought to, that right in and of itself should bring us a certain level of humility, right? I never cared for that. But guess what? We've all got one. All right, so <clears throat> the, the why of the word is that God wants the anointing to break any yoke of bondage in your life. And he wants to pull the gold out. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come to me, all of you who are weary. He wants to speak a word to them that are weary. That's the why of the word. The why of the word is he loves us. And he loves us that much that he wants any kind of yoke of the flesh or the world or the devil that is controlling us and keeping us from God's best, keeping the purposes of God from coming to pass in our life. He wants those things broken. And I like that. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's not out to punish you or to make your life miserable. He's out to make it easier so that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. He's actually looking out for you, and yet we think that, <clears throat> we think that he's just trying to make our life structured and rigid and miss out on our personal happiness. And God's saying, this is time to wake up, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That's the fifth element or the why of the word. All of these things, I spent weeks and months taking them one at a time and going slowly. I'm giving you seven of them in one sermon. So that doesn't mean, okay, I know this now, I've got it. No, you take these things and you apply it in your own relationship with God one at a time until you're really allowing him to cultivate something. Because he takes truth, he cultivates that truth, and then you should see the fruit of a transformed life. If not, you just 
That word hasn't been made flesh. It's not written on the tablet of your heart. You're not a living epistle of it. You don't own it yet. You're not a partaker of that divine nature. The residue of, that, of his nature is not being reflected in your life. Look for the fruit. You shall know them by their fruit. doesn't say you shall know them by their words because that's actually the counterfeit. Did we not prophesy? Did we not cast out devils? I knew you not. Intimacy and fruit of that intimacy is the ultimate test. Okay, so the sixth element, the wear of the word. God says, the Lord given me the tongue of a learned disciple that I would know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear. For the Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious nor did I turn away. That's important because it's got to be a submission to God's strategy. Uh, you, you almost need a Gethsemane first when it comes to not my will but thy will be done. There is a <clears throat> an inner ability where the God says I'm going to open your ear to hear but how sensitive that hearing ear becomes will be dependent upon how you respond to that word when you hear it. Were you rebellious? Did you turn away from it? And I saw that the, the, the primary weakness in God cultivating the ear of a mystic or the average believer really hearing from God was a kind of a pick and choose what I want to obey and what I don't want to obey. Kind of like it's a Holy Spirit smorgasbord when God says, no, 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 I speak just like a lawyer would in a courtroom, a specific word for a specific situation to get a specific result. I don't just give you the whole Bible and tell you to pick and choose what you want. I pick and choose what is best interest for your life so that things would go well with you. And to the degree that you open up to it, and actually, uh, <clears throat> the wear of the word was when he said, morning by morning, I'll awaken your ear. But the prerequisite was that I will obey when I hear. Because that keeps the sensitivity to where he can awaken you morning by morning. And like I said, I never had trouble hearing from God but there was a prerequisite to not having trouble hearing from God, and that was obeying the last thing you heard. Why should he give you another word if you didn't like the last one he gave you because it was inconvenient? And I saw that morning by morning means day by day. This precludes the fact that you must have obeyed the day before morning by morning. And you know what he taught me during this time? Sufficient unto the day is the evil of thereof. Night and day. That God established a boundary. Even in creation. The heavens and the earth. The waters from above and the waters beneath. He established the first three days of creation. He established boundaries. And what God is doing is basically saying, I've established boundaries. And my goal for a believer is to awaken you morning by morning. Technically, you can't skip a day. What, do you think you're just going to float along on last week's revelation? That's not going to do you much good if you're not maintaining that relationship. Morning by morning, he awakens my ear to hear. And then it, and then it, it demands that you're not rebellious nor that you turn away, but that you obey the last thing that you heard. And after all, you know, the old saying in the church used to be, why should I give you another word if you haven't done the last thing that I said? We did that in, even in counseling sessions with people. It's like, if you won't do your homework, why did you make another appointment? You didn't do the last thing that we said. I use that as a strict criteria. If God used it as a strict criteria with developing a relationship with me, why shouldn't I hold that as a criteria for dealing with people? Why make another appointment when you didn't do the last thing? It's like, who are you depending on? Are you looking more for an excuse? Or what this scripture meant for me was a steadfast devotion to purpose that I might know him. And God's saying, I'm laying it out for you to know me. I'm making myself available to whosoever. But in that availability, you need a steadfast devotion to the purpose. And what purpose is it? 
to cultivate the ear of a mystic, to be a person that knows God and is known by God and is owned by God. So when I asked him this morning by morning to not be rebellious, what did God want? So how do I do this? What do you want from me? And he used an interesting term. I think it was a Smith Wigglesworth term, but he used to call it a babe spirit. And I said, a what? And it was like a babe spirit. And the scriptures he gave me, of course, was, assuredly I say to you, unless you become converted and become like little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom. Well, I was passionately pursuing him. I wanted the kingdom. I had steadfast devotion to purpose that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted, but I need to be like a little child. So when he awakens me morning by morning, where does he do this? He says, I do this morning by morning, but there's a condition of the heart that's necessary. Not only do I need your obedience, I need you to come childlike. And this this is one of the places that we learned that the most effective ministry in praying with other people is not when they come for an appointment and say, I've got this issue with my father. We say, close your eyes and let the Holy Spirit bring to mind, unless the Holy Spirit already brought the situation with your father to mind, but close your eyes and let God pick and choose the sequence, the order, and the need. And I find it far superior that if you would come like a child and say, God, search my heart, and I'm not going to get in my reasoning mind and tell God what I need, but rather I'm going to open my heart wide and I'm going to let God go individually into that place in my heart and in my mind where he speaks it. Let him speak, let him pick and choose the cherry, so to speak. Not as a um, smorgasbord. And he said, out of the mouths and babes and nursing infants, God says, I've hidden these things from the wise and the prudent. And I've revealed them to babes. This key is so important because mostly the greatest sabotage believers have is they sabotage with their reasoning mind or they've relied on their intelligence for so long that it's actually interfering with hearing from God because God says, I've hidden these things from the wise, the prudent, and I'm revealing them unto babes. And everybody has the capacity for that babe spirit to just basically say, God, what are you saying? I'm going to humble myself like a little child. What are you saying? You watch in the days ahead, God's going to work on that over and over again because we've got lots of thinkers in the church that are actually robbing themselves of a quality relationship with God because they're figuring him out. They're figuring out. But children are intuitive and trusting, aren't they? You ever seen a child stand at the top of the steps and catch me? They'll drop, they go, no, don't jump. All right? God wants that restored back from into your Christian walk. That babe spirit is totally yielded, totally dependent. There's an inward hunger to learn. Do you know how quickly children learn and how hungry they are? This is a true disciple. I will give you the tongue of a learned day that I waken morning by morning. I will awaken your ear to hear as a disciple. The seventh and the last is the way of the word. When he said, I was not rebellious, nor did I turn it away. I didn't fight. I didn't run from it. But here was the next eye opener for me. God took me to Jeremiah and he showed me, here's the missing ingredient to way the word is not working in many people's lives. They don't understand the way it operates. Most people would like to do, and you've been, most of you have been trained this way, is to find the word, decree the word, pray the word, declare the word, prophesy the word, preach the word, preach it, prophesy, say it, say it over and over again. If you, but your much saying is not going to produce that word or make it come to alive. That what God said was, he said, even with the young prophet Jeremiah, he says, he told the prophet Jeremiah, he touched my mouth and the Lord said, behold, I put my words in your mouth. I have set before you over this day and over the kingdoms to root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, to build and to plant. Most of us just focus on building and planting. But guess what? That word has to remove strongholds and other things 
in our lives before you're going to build or plant anything by your much saying. You can say it over and over again. I watch people say things like, from their spirit, fear was ruling in their heart. And they go, a perfect love casts out fear. A perfect love casts out fear. A perfect, you know, you can say that over and over again, but you have no anointing on it. There's no substance on it, and it's not going to change anything. If it does change anything, you're probably fortifying fear in your life through your much saying it, because the nature attached to the word has not been properly dealt with. Your much speaking, prophesying, preaching is not going to accomplish anything. It's what nature is attached to that word. And what God showed me is that in order to root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, then to build and to plant, that he told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, what do you see? He see, I see an almond tree or a waking tree. He says, precisely, I'm about to awaken my word to perform it. God has to awaken that word and he will give you morning by morning. He will awaken your ear to hear. You want to hear a now word. You want a word that has been uh, incited to action, stirred up, aroused. But incite to action or arise. God basically says, I'm going to send my word and it's going to root out evil. It's going to pull down authorities, altars, families of thoughts. I'm going to pull them down. I'm going to destroy. I'm going to corrupt the soil of your heart so that only good things grow. Isn't that the parable of the sower? Sows a seed. The kinds of soils is the kind of a heart receptivity. That soil is the heart. The seed is the word. What kind of heart? Good ground that's going to produce. I'm going to root out the evil. I'm going to pull out the weeds. And some of you definitely need to get that series on bitter roots. Because you're living with unnecessary trials and tribulations. And you're calling it spiritual warfare. When in reality it's bitter roots that need to be removed. And... The second thing is you need to pull down some mental strongholds that are standing in the way of the truth lodging and becoming an epistle or written on the tablet of the heart. Thirdly, you need to destroy the soil. To destroy the soil does not mean to corrupt it for good. It means to corrupt it so that only good grows there. When it's weeds out of your garden, you've got more room for the good stuff to be planted. Then throw down. God says some of those lies some of the greatest strongholds, some of the things the enemies used in your life the most. Come on, you've got lies in your head that you're still believing as a spirit-filled believer. Those lies properly renounced and brought down properly builds the foundation for God to build his truth on top of it. He will build something beautiful on the top of the devastation of those things, those strongholds that you throw down. His truth will be erected. He will be the strong tower. Then he will build and plant. I want to break this right now in, in closing. There's three enemies that I see over and over and over again. And we want to pray that these three things are dealt with according to the measure of the Spirit of God within you. Number one, exalted concepts and ideas, exalting concepts and ideas above experience in God. When your ideas and your experience are exalted above your actual experience in God, they will cause you harm. Secondly, you reason away much spiritual experience because it sounds too hard. Have you ever done that? That sounds too hard. Whatever he's preaching sounds too hard. What you're doing is you're failing to bring God into it. Third element is you fail to put into practice the last thing God told you. You're not a doer of the word. Therefore, there's a hardening of the heart. And lastly, I believe that there are some people that could prosper and be delivered except they are so buried under disappointments. It's like the potential is there. It's like a volcano of potential in God is there, but you spend so much time being disappointed. Anything with a dis on it is from the pit of hell. Dissatisfied, discouragement, dis. If it's got a dis in front of it, it's not God, all right? Disappointments are burying you, and God wants to break those. So, Father, we just pray right now 
that you are going to unfold in the days ahead and cultivate the ear of a mystic. It caused me to draw closer to you with greater sensitivity to hear your word and obey that word. Grant unto me this day a newfound steadfast devotion to purpose. And that purpose is that I might know him, that I might progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his person. And pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.